Hey, what's going on, folks? It's Mike here, and welcome to the next lesson in our OpenGL series. Now, in this lesson, we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about triangles and just where we're heading in OpenGL as far as using OpenGL to actually render some triangles. So as a quick experiment, go ahead and find a piece of paper if you want, or just follow along, and go ahead and create a triangle from it by just bending it in half like this. Now, triangles have an interesting property in that if I take one of the corners here, I have a perfectly flat triangle and I try to bend it or twist it, the rest of the triangle moves with it. In fact, this is actually a really important property of a triangle and why we use it. The fact that it always remains planar here and it's not going to have any curves or anything sort of weird associated with the triangle. This lets us quickly rasterize or fill in the individual pixels when we model things with triangles. So that's one reason why we use triangles in 3D graphics, especially in interactive computer graphics. If you go on to look at movies like at Pixar and DreamWorks, for instance, they might use other rendering techniques that could be in another series. But for now, we're going to focus on interactive programs and triangles. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at what we've been doing here. So here's a model of a triangle here, this golem that uh, showed up here. And as I mentioned, if you look closely, this golem model is made out of triangles. So the properties of triangles that we like are that it's planar and it's just a simple shape to work with. Given enough triangles, we can approximate some character like this with relative uh, ease in the sense of how the graphics hardware actually processes these triangles. So some other properties of triangles, just so you're aware of the terminology, we say that we have three vertices here and that's at uh, each of the uh, points here. So shown here, here, and here. And triangles are connected by, or rather the vertices, excuse me, are connected by these edges here. And these are uh, line segments essentially between two vertices. And oftentimes in this graphic series, you're gonna hear me refer to things as points or vertexes. Um, you might be, you might want to think of a triangle like a graph and call it a node. That's probably okay, but in this context, we really want to think of it as a vertex and it's actual geometry. And then this actual triangle here is what we'd call a face here. This triangle has one face, or at least one front face facing outwards. On the other side of the triangle, there would be one other face as well. Okay, so now that we have a little bit of a review of triangles and what they are, let's talk about some of the OpenGL structures that we're actually going to be using here. So last time, if you watched our previous lesson, we actually did some code to do our first OpenGL function call. That was this GL get string. And that was to ensure that OpenGL and so on had been set up. But before we move further, again, with rendering triangles, I actually want to take a step back and give you some idea of what we're gonna be doing in the next lesson when we open up some code. So the idea is we're gonna be using two OpenGL objects to achieve this. So let me go ahead and just label this here, open GL objects. And there's a lot of different objects in OpenGL, and I'll talk a little bit about this later on when we talk about code, again, just to help you with your mental model of OpenGL. But the two that we're gonna work with are vertex array objects, and they're often abbreviated VAO, for instance. And I'll go ahead and explain what this is in a moment. The second thing that we're going to work with is called a vertex buffer object. And they're usually abbreviated VBO. And these usually have to deal with the actual vertex information. So let me go ahead and uh, label that here for you. So this is the actual data and vertex array object which the name's a little bit confusing, but it's how to access your vertex buffer object, or at least that's how I'd like you to think about it for now. So let me sort of pictorially try to give you an idea of what this means. So again, going back to our idea here of what a triangle is. Now, each of these individual vertices here, and I'm just going to highlight one, has a X, Y, and a Z position here. And I'm actually going to label these here, x1, y1, and z1. And we could do the same for our other vertices. For now, I'll just go ahead and put a number here, 1, 2, and 3. It doesn't really matter the order that I specify them in. But somewhere I need to capture this information if I'm going to pass it to my hardware so we know how to represent this triangle. 
And again, to do this, we're going to use something called a vertex buffer object. So what does this mean? Well, a buffer itself is actually just an array or a block of data here. So let me go ahead and label this. So x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2, x3, y3, and z3. You get the point here. OK, so this is essentially just an array here. So what we do as far as OpenGL syntax is we have to generate one of these buffers. So we'll use GL, gen, buffers. And usually there's some arguments here, like how many we want, and then a handle so we can sort of keep track of this object here. So my object, something of this nature. And then what we're eventually going to do is GL buffer data, which is to populate this actual structure here. OK, that'll be the function call that we use. And there's one other call I want to sneak in here, which is going to be GL bind buffer which is essentially saying, hey, we want to work with this specific buffer. OK, so those are the function calls that you're going to see associated with vertex buffer objects most often. OK, so this is our first vertex buffer object, VBO1. Now, how does the vertex array object play into this? Well, let's go ahead and label it here, vertex array object here. So again, it is some sort of object and if you want to think about this in terms of Java or C++, where you have objects, it's collecting some number of attributes, I suppose. So let me go ahead and label it as such, VAO1. And syntactically, we're going to have something similar here, where we do GL, and here I'll do it in the same uh, font here, uh, gen or creation vertex arrays. OK, so similar syntax here with a GL gen. That means we are allocating something or getting ready to allocate something. Uh, how many vertex arrays we want, usually just one at a time. And then whatever we're going to call our vertex array object. And then we'll bind to this vertex array object. So GL uh, bind me, vertex array and the vertex array that we want to bind to. And again, when we bind to something that's essentially saying, hey, in OpenGL speak, select this vertex array object. There's something we want to do with it. OK, now what actually lives inside of this vertex array object, though? Well, this is what's sort of interesting, and we're going to see it in the uh, actual OpenGL syntax. But we essentially have these attributes. And what are the attributes of a triangle? Well, position is actually an attribute here. So position. So what our vertex array object is doing is essentially saying, hey, how do I walk through my vertex buffer object? Well, what does my vertex buffer object consist of? Three positions here, or three floats here for x, y, and z. And that's how we get to our, say, first vertex here. And then we get to the next vertex, which would be over here, and then to the next vertex over here. So essentially, we just have one attribute here in our vertex array object. So all vertex array objects are, are sort of a specification. Again, part of that vertex specification in our graphics pipeline that says, hey, when I've got some data here, how do I access that data? Now, just to give you a different idea of another type of VAO we could have, let me go ahead and create another VAO here. And I'm going to give it attribute one here and attribute two. We don't really have better names for them. That's just uh, how it is for now. And let me go ahead and just create another vertex buffer object here. But this time, I'm going to do something just a little bit different. I'm going to have an x, y, and z position for all of our vertices, as well as a red, green, and blue value here. So what's different this time? Attribute one is going to point to our actual position data. Attribute 2 will point to our red, green, and blue data. But for instance, if I've made these vertices red, this is how we would get color inside of our triangle. Our rasterization pipeline would read in the positions, so we know where to position vertices 1, 2, and 3. And then we have some more data that we want to pass in or use in our pipeline, which is the actual colors of those vertices. 
And depending on what type of data that I want to access, that is these vertex buffer objects, I either activate vertex array zero here, or excuse me, one here, or vertex array, well, object two here that we have. So that's how I can sort of change how the OpenGL state machine works. And that is to say how the rendering pipeline works based off of what type of data I have in my buffers. So I'm going to go ahead and close the lesson here because this is a really important idea here. Well, a few important ideas rather that we've covered. The first is that we're going to be primarily working with triangles in this series. I think it's a great place to start. We can talk about points and lines later. But now we at least know the importance of triangles when trying to render various characters here. And the second big idea here is that we're going to be using different OpenGL objects. Now again, OpenGL is a C-based API, so we don't have classes and these types of things, but rather collections of functions, things like this, where we're going to generate an object, bind to it, and then populate that actual data. And those things working together will, in a sense, form an object or some collection of data. And then we have this idea of a vertex array object, which tells us how we're going to access this data, and then the actual data itself, which lives in a vertex buffer object. So folks, I hope that was a useful lesson for you. In fact, I'm going to go back here one more time. I'll remove myself from the screen here just so you can get an overview of this picture here, because I think this will be helpful for you to just uh, understand and take in. So if you want to pause the video back there, feel free to do so. We'll get into coding in uh, the next uh, lesson or so, so we can actually put into practice this idea of a vertex array object and vertex buffer object. And in these early lessons, I'm really going to keep hammering in some of these ideas and taking some pauses like this lesson to talk a little bit about the theory. I hope that'll be helpful for you. So make sure you don't miss those lessons. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you comment below if this wasn't clear. But we will be revisiting these topics many times. And the good news is it doesn't really get much more complicated than this. We just have to understand how things are working. All right, folks, we'll go ahead and see you in the next one.